Welcome to Senate Education, uh, Tuesday, April 25th. We're going to jump into Senator Gulick's bill, S-132, and then uh, move on for about an hour and a half or so on 483, 461, miscellaneous. Uh, Ed will wrap up with, with additional testimony that we talked about on uh, the amendment from Borgang and others having to do with bullying and harassment seems to be one point that we need to finish this week so we can move 461. With that, Mr. Schaubert, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to ask Senator Felix, would you just remind us what the bill, what we're trying to do here? Do you mind, or would you rather have... Uh, I'm happy to do it. It has to do with um, signatures to get on the ballot for school board and how there seems to be a discrepancy. It's right. a, kind of like a technical fix for some of the smaller communities. Right. In rural communities, you were saying they had to get as many as some of our bigger communities. Actually, more. <laughs> I need to get 50 in Burlington to get on the school board. And yeah. my, my compatriot here, Mark Schauber, has to get 60. And the population of his community is a fraction of my, of where I live. So um, it seems like it's a problem that needs to be rectified. Yep. Mr. Schauber, we ended up uh, one day in, uh, when we were going through this bill, we had started to hear some witnesses who kind of expressed a little bit of concern. I, I don't remember. I think what it was had something to do with depending on the district and the size of the district. So maybe you can just help us get to a, a good point on this. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much for um, having me in to testify um, and especially allowing me to do it remotely. My uh, my district's annual meeting is tonight um, and I would have would have been tough for me to get back here um, if I had been up in Montpelier. So I appreciate it. Um, as a, by way of, uh, uh, River Valleys yeah. um, a Unified School District that's made up of Dover and Wardsboro. Um, in Wyndham County. Um, so, well, by way of just a quick introduction, um, I'm Mark Schauber and I am a board member in River Valley School District. I'm also um, the representative um, from River Valleys or a representative from River Valleys on the Wyndham Central um, Supervisory Union Board. Um, I'm also a member of the uh, Vermont School Board Association Board from w Wyndham County. Um, and some of you may know me from the work that I did as the executive director for the Coalition for Vermont Student Equity, um, the work on people waiting and at 20, 127 um, last year. Um, so um, uh, I apologize. I gave, made some notes for myself and I'm just pulling them up. Um, so um, I do want to say that Today, I'm here in my capacity as a citizen and voter of Dover, as well as a member of the River Valley's um, Unified School District Board, um, and basically asking you to make what I believe is a pretty simple fix um, to uh, Title 16, Chapter 11, which went through a major rewrite, as you know, especially uh, Chair Campion last session, um, which resulted in Act 176. Um, so 176 introduced some new governance models to Chapter 11, um, which I think may have been in use prior to the rewrite, but weren't actually codified in statute. Um, and I just want to say briefly, because I've been asked a number of times, that the sections of Chapter 11 that are referred to in S-132 um, would only affect school districts that elect their board members by Australian ballot. Um, those that elect them from the floor um, at their annual meetings don't go through a petition process, so they wouldn't be affected by the passage of uh, 132 at all. Um, prior to Act 176, the standard for any person who wanted to be a candidate for a school board position was to get 30 signatures or 1% of registered voters in their town or district on a petition. Act 176 left this standard intact for all boards that fit under the proportional model which includes most districts in the state. Essentially, those districts, the proportional ones, are ones that are single town districts or ones where each member town elects their own representatives. Um, Act 176 introduced the modified at large model. Um, there's also the at large model, and I'm not sure whether that was in statute prior to Chapter 11 um, rewrite or not. The modified at large model is one in which each member town has a set number of representatives 
but the entire district, so the registered voters from all the towns, vote for all members, regardless of which town the candidates are from. Um, an at-large district differs in that all members can come from any member town. They're not a set number per town. Um, and again, all voters vote um, for all members. For my district, the River Valley School District, um, which I said includes Dover and Wardsboro, um, we were established in 2017 as an Act 46 merger. Um, and we had a proportional board with proportions based on census data with reapportion reapportionment to be done every after every decennial census. So based on the 2010 data, which was used um, for our initial number of years, each of our two towns had three representatives um, and they were only elected by the voters in their town. The with the 2020 census data, um, Dover's population went up from 1124 to 1798, an increase of 674. Wardsboro's population went down from 900 to 869, a reduction of 31. As a result, um, and, and because of our articles of agreement that were approved in 2017, we were supposed to reapportion to a 4-2 board, which would have given us four representatives from Dover and two from Wardsboro. Um, the majority of our board didn't want to do this, so we started looking at alternate options. And the board chose to change to a modified at large model where we would permanently have three members from each town, regardless of the population, and they would all be elected by the entire district. <clears throat> and during the discussions of this change, one of the issues that came up was that in this new model, we would need 60 signatures on petitions. Uh, and that was a huge change from what we previously had, um, which was 14 in Dover, which was 1% of our registered voters, and six in Wardsboro, 1% of their registered voters. Um, so we would have needed a total of 20 under the merged district prior to Act 176. Um, so as um, Senator Gulick mentioned, um, the number of signatures in Burlington, so 60 may not be that bad for their registered, um, their number of registered voters, which is roughly 37,000. Um, but in our small towns, that can be difficult to obtain. <clears throat> um, and in fact, um, and Senator Gulick, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe Burlington, you only need 30 signatures um, on your petitions. Um, which is half of what we would need in River Valleys where we only have 2000 registered voters. So there's quite that discrepancy. Um, so, I remember 50, but it could be 30. Felt like 50. <laughs> That's always a lot. I know that um, I believe as a Senator, you have to get a hundred um, if I remember correctly. And um, uh, house reps have to get 50, 50 I think, yeah. yeah. Um, so, wow. um, so basically, there are a few reasons why I think that uh, a change is warranted to um, to Chapter 11 to bring it back in line with um, a single standard across all school districts. Um, first, just consistency across the state for all school districts, um, and then also so you have some consistency throughout the state. The excuse me, the statute. Um, including across different sections. Um, fairness and equity, um, as I mentioned, with the, the discrepancy in the numbers. Um, and because we really want more participation in our democracy and adding this new barrier to doing this seems counterproductive. Um, I know personally, um, about five years ago when I was first running for the board, um, I was relatively new to Vermont at the time. I still am to some extent. I've been here now for nine years. And if I had had to achieve 60 signatures on a petition, um, it would have felt um, undoable for me um, with the number of people that I knew and my comfort level in the town that I wouldn't have run. Um, and I think we want to be encouraging more people to run for public service and not discouraging it. Um, and that, that's basically it. I, I do want to um, thank Legislative Council Beth St. James for pointing out, that as originally drafted, S-132 had left some districts. I believe the uh, elementary school um, uh, boards still needing 60 signatures. So I think that um, correcting that definitely makes the bill stronger. 
Um, and I want to thank Senator Gulick for sponsoring the bill and you, Chair Campion, and the whole committee for taking it up. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, in all honesty, um, I was talking to our, our town clerk about it this morning. One of the things I absolutely love about Vermont um, and one of the reasons I love living here is that somebody can bring, somebody like me, can bring something to to somebody in the legislature and have it acted upon. Um, and I think that's a, an amazing thing that we have in our in our state. So thank you. And I can tell you, your senator is here as well, <clears throat> Senator Hashim. We weren't gonna take it up until he said, I want this bill taken up. <clears throat> I appreciate that. that. And then we took it up. <laughs> I uh, yeah, no, this is I appreciate Senator Gulick and others putting it forward. Um, and would you describe this then, Mark, when we get to the floor with it, uh, that this is a we made a mistake in Chapter 11 when we did that rewrite. Is that what what happened? Is that what kind of fixing here? I believe so. I believe this yeah. is a technical okay. fix. Um, I, I think there was a lot of cutting and pasting that was done. I mean, it was what a 150 or 200 page bill that, that rewrite. Um, and I think that that's really all that happened was that there was some cutting and pasting done and some details that that were just missed. Okay. Any concerns? No. Any questions? Yes. Senator Gulick, how are you feeling about it? I'm feeling good. I'm trying to find the language around middle and elementary schools. Yeah. Did, you, did you, do you guys see that in here? Let's see. Would you remind us what that question was that people raised, the middle and elementary school? I think that St. James brought it up that that the elementary and middle schools were not included in this, and um, I can't remember if we made the fix or not. I believe you asked um, Ms. St. James to, to do that. I don't know whether it's been done yet. And in the as introduced bill, it, it is still um, just the section, I think, 711 and 730. Um, I believe, yeah. Um, so those boards would be a, a different section number. Quite honestly, I don't know which section it is. Let's see if that can zoom in for a minute, and we'll just get this tidied up now. <clears throat> Yeah, we just wanted to yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. Pull in the elementary and middle schools, right? That's yes, that is my understanding. And we'll see if that can jump in for a minute. We're going to invite Ledge Council in right now, Mark. Uh, see if she can join us for a second, so we can just settle this and hopefully uh, move it. Great. Senator Gulick, do you have a preference that. whether or not you would like this to go as a separate bill or if you'd like it attached to miscellaneous ed? I do not have a preference to you. Which one would it survive, have the highest chances of survival? Uh, good question. I think both. <clears throat> well, it's good. It's a nice bill. Yeah, so it'd have to get a rural suspension, which I don't think they would they would do they'd be concerned about, but our house counterparts could ignore it. I don't think they would, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we don't have to decide right now. But we'll, we can. We're gonna. These are both gonna leave this week. So one way or the other, we just have to make sure. I think we've been talking about putting it in this lane. Yeah. We have. We yeah. have. Uh, she's in ways and means. Okay, she's in ways and means. Okay. Um, well, we will ask her to add elementary and middle school, and when she's available, maybe she could join us for uh, for. Uh, for a few minutes. <clears throat> Anything else from you, Mr. Schauber? Um, not on this. Um, if Since I'm here, um, if, um, if you don't mind, I'd like to make a quick comment on 43, since you're going to be sure. discussing that next. Um, so basically, the, the way I, I see 483 um, is that it, it's a bill that, that is bringing a, a, a bit more equity, what I call equity and funding transparency. Um, taxpayers all work really hard for their, their earnings. And I think they have the right to know that the rules that are applied um, equally across all schools um, that are receiving money from the Ed Fund. Um, I believe that allowing 
um, private schools to select their students, um, even if it's as simple as them having the ability to discourage some students during a admissions process, um, which could be subtle, but still there, um, is, a, is, is a problem and goes against uh, the very nature of um, the equity that should be attached to the use of public education funds. Um, so I would strongly urge you to, to pass forward. Um, I do believe that bringing the two systems a little closer together um, is um, going to help make our public education system, including our private and independent schools, stronger. Um, so I would encourage you to, to move forward with that. And I thank you for indulging me in, in those comments. Happy to. Great. So we'll keep you posted. <clears throat> uh, when we see Ledge Council, we'll ask them to make that change. And uh, glad you were able to be with us. And we will either attach the miscellaneous debt or send it out on its own so that it will be ready to go uh, by next uh, March is when this, we would want this in place. Great. I'm available if you have any further questions. And I really thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Okay. Take care. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Okay. So we're just waiting for our next witness to hop on, please. Just uh, curious. Um, I think I've looked ahead on the agenda for the week, but can you can you outline the you know any kind of big movements expected Wednesday through Friday? Like what are we you know something we're going to vote on? That's I would say we're four sixty one for sure, okay. and likely this as well. CJ, thanks for joining us. It's great to see you. Uh, you came to us, I know you're a constituent, I believe, of Senator Gulix, but it was Senator Chittenden and Senator Mazza uh, that brought a situation to our attention. And, and I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, and maybe Senator Gulick may have mentioned this as well. Correct me if I'm wrong, CJ. If 483, so there's uh, some constituents in Senator Maz's district that use your school right now. And you were feeling as though if 483 were to go into effect, it would you would not be able to take those students in the future and you were looking for us to grandfather students in? Correct. Okay, can you tell us, explain what's happening in 483 that you have concerns about, because if you were to say, okay, 483 is, you know, if you look at the basic parts of 483, there's a big part about, uh, you know, anti-discrimination policy. There's this requiring that students don't have interviews and admissions tours that can impact their admissions. You've got, uh, uh, what else is in there? The moratorium. What's in there that really would? And then there's the also the other piece, the 25 miles out of state. So I'm just trying to get a sense of what is it that you that would cause you to not take students from uh, dis other districts, from tuition districts. Sure. Um, well, I, thank you for for inviting me in to speak, and I'm glad to share about our our position, our situation. Um, there are a number of things in the bill that impacts different independent schools, but us specifically, there are two parts. One is the um, not having an admissions process, and two, there's a part in there, I can't remember what section it is, that talks about reviewing all applicable um, public school requirements that should be applied to independent schools. And we're so small um, that we don't have the bandwidth to, well, let me back up for a moment. I came, I think it was in December, sometime this winter. Anywhere. What, what? Go ahead. I came earlier and talked about rock points. I don't want to bore you, but we, if there's a spectrum of schools, um, you know, we have uh, people who are high flying college bound students. And then we have kids on the other end that are, are in the hospital because they can't, they're just, they need so much mental health and uh, support. 
we're in the middle on the education side of things. Our students, we're, we're, we're a niche where we're not um, competing with public schools or larger schools for students. It's when they can't function or not getting to school, then they're out of their, their realm. And then, then we're looking at kid, to help kids there. So with that said, um, you know, we've had, we've not accepted some students that were too, too high functioning. We're saying, no, we're not going to take you because you'd be, you'd be just sitting and spinning. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be healthy for you. And we've, we've not taken some kids that needed more than we have to offer because we're in this small bandwidth where half our kids have come from a treatment center and they need a landing place to land and other kids are struggling. They're not getting to school and they're, they're not engaging for a whole host of reasons. Um, whether it's high functioning ASD, whether it's suicidal ideation, depression, anxiety, reactive attachment disorder. It could be a, a variety of reasons that they're not getting to school, but we create this atmosphere where kids with this on tender hooks can come into school and start where they are and we move them forward very slowly. So, so we have a, a kind of a range that we, can, that we can serve well. Without having an admissions process, we wouldn't be able to kind of protect that space for the kids that are here now and really work in our wheelhouse to help the kids that we're doing so successfully. And if we were to take some kid, any kid new, my interpretation is that we have to take any kid without an without admissions process. And I think that could, we're so small, that could really disrupt the learning experience of the kids that are here now. Um, and I also feel like ethically to take the money, I'd have to have no, no um, admissions process. So um, I would have to follow that. If I didn't follow that, I'm opening the school up for a lawsuit and we don't have the you know, we're, we're doing okay, but we don't have like all these funds to help protect ourselves and as a steward of the school, I'm trying to say, how do I protect these kids, provide this service, and by losing that gate to come in, um, we're not discriminating, but we're trying to find the right match for kids. Yeah. Um, and so I think that having, I, I'm really impressed with the efforts put into look at discrimination in our state and our schools, because I think any school that's discriminating shouldn't be approved, shouldn't be allowed. I, that just, that like, focusing on that behavior makes sense to me. For the schools like ours that have a have a niche that we're not trying to pull people from other schools, our kids are coming that they, they can't get to school. I thought we had a carve out for that's, that's, schools like yours in terms of the admission process. That, that's my that was hi CJ. That was my question. Um, so there seems uh, as far as I can tell, there's a provision in 483 that would allow students um, on an IEP or a 504 to go to the school that best suits their needs. Would that not be you all? So we're not a therapeutic, I think a therapeutic school, is it, is it for therapeutics, right? Is that yeah, the best thing? It is yeah. the kind of therapeutics, yes. So, so we're, we're not, a, I, I call us lowercase t therapeutic. We don't have therapists on staff. We don't have a psychiatrist. We don't have a full-time special educator. We have a special educator who consults with highly competent staff. All of our students are in therapy, but outside of the school. And so not every student in our schools on a EIEP or 504 plan. So we don't qualify for that. And that would actually be, we'd become a different kind of school. So we don't fit into that carve out. Okay, thank okay. you. Senator, yeah. just the comment on what you just said, CJ, you know, I, I think that's that's the challenge that I'm feeling yeah. the, the issue with is that, you know, it, at least in my district, what I've learned very clearly over the last few weeks is there are a lot more schools than I thought that take students who have needs that aren't necessarily in an IEP or a 504. And, you know, it, it's, yeah, the, the, the challenge is figuring out how to, how to navigate that. And so it's, um, yeah, that's just wanted to share that. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I, I have the same concern. It's how do you make, make sure that there's a, a good fit for a student if they're on a 504 or, or uh, IEP or not, and they just have particular needs that you want to make sure are met by the school. We heard uh, we're having some people in public schools do this. CTE programs do a big admissions process. We're going to hear about it where kids get rejected sometimes because they're not a fit for that program. So we're looking to make sure there's some consistency there. Uh, we heard, I think we have them coming in, the local CTE program turned away, I think, They'll tell us 60 kids last year. Uh, these are public dollars, but the kids just aren't a fit for that program for one reason or another. What's what's CTE? It's attached to Spalding, 
so it's CBCC, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I wonder if I know, because I feel like the intent is really to have to serve kids and to support kids, and we're trying to find our way through this. I wonder what the best way is to, to look at independent and public schools collectively on that spectrum I refer to, to, to when we're looking at a kid's need, like where in there, collectively looking at like, where can that kid get the, what they need the best and, um, and direct them in that direction? Um, it seems like a different approach, but I just wonder how we can work together more. Yeah, certainly. CJ, do you know what other states do? with this particular issue. Do you have any, I, I, I need to do some research, but I've just been wondering like what Massachusetts does and other New England states and do you know? That's a great question. I don't know, but I do have some contacts in ASNI and I could help connect you and, and myself. We could, we, could do, we could do it together to find out because I'd be curious too. Um, the ASNI is the Association of Independent Schools of New England. Yeah, thanks. You, yeah. Yeah, it'd be interesting to find if you can find if, if some of these schools have just decided not to do interviews or campus tours. I mean, frankly, I feel like it's a it's a kind of a self-esteem. I think it helps a student in some ways to tour, to visit, to interview, to have that kind of experience. I haven't been convinced that it's a bad thing, um, but the House obviously has, so I'm trying to figure that out a little bit. And I think others on this committee are as well. Yeah, I think if the tenor, the tenor of the experiences, and think we talk about um, you know, transferable skills. So for a young person to be saying, is this, you know, schools, I'm che schools checking, checking me out, but I'm checking out the school and I'm trying to find the right match. And, and as opposed to like, are you going to get into this elite, elite situation? That's not what we're trying to do and have them be part of like, no, you, you need to be thoughtful and, and, and be engaged in your process too, whether it's for, high school, for college, for a job, for wherever you are, like that kind of learning is really important, but not about exclusive better or worse. Like what's the right thing? You know, I talk to my students who go to college. I say, don't worry about the label. Don't, you don't need to go to some label school. Like you go to the school, the college that, that makes sense for you. Because so. once, once you get out beyond that, no one's looking at that school. Like you know, they, they just want to know if you, pat, you figured you finished it or not. And, and what you want to do is learn and grow and become more and more effective. And that's, what, if you go to some school that you think looks good, but isn't the right match, yeah. that doesn't help you. I just wanted to make a comment about, I think my sense is the intention of this bill, generally speaking, is to achieve a little bit more equity between some of our quote unquote, independent, private schools, approved independent schools, and public schools, because some of these independent schools receive public dollars, it seems as though they should have to operate in relatively similar ways um, that, to the public schools. And I think in terms of the admission process, generally speaking, public schools take everybody. And my sense, I, again, I'm not in the house. But we did hear, just for record, kids can be expelled, and there's nothing. But my, that my can sense happen. is this bill was trying to get to an equity lens, and that independent schools need to as, accept everyone in the same way public schools do if they accept public dollars. That's just me and trying to interpret. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, she, I agree with that, but the challenge that I'm facing is, for example, these niche schools, uh, Rock Point, Compass, uh, you know, whatever they are, where do they fall into the picture when their role is to predominantly accept students that, that are facing uh, behavioral challenges, whether or not they fall in an IEP or a 504? I mean, you know, for example, Compass, there's, there's a number of kids who go there because they got bullied excessively in, in the nearby public school. And you know that's not something that lands on a 504 or IEP. So, I mean, what I'm trying to figure out is how to take into consideration these niche schools that serve a specific purpose, but aren't in the therapeutic school category without passing a bill that will really you know, cause a lot of problems for them. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I think we heard also from the kid from Sharon Academy. They got bullied 
at the public school they wanted to leave, so you go on campus, you see what the other kids are like, you kind of get a feel for it, you sit down in the classroom, just kind of feel if it's going to be a safe spot for you. Um, yeah. CJ, please continue. Anything yes. else? Anything else you want to add? Um, I think that uh, sounds like you guys are right in the mix of it, and it's a great, great uh, process and discussion. Um, I think you've heard my my concerns around the enrollment, but also the, there was a part in there about um, applying other public school requirements. And again, um, and I invite anyone, you know, Martine, for sure, this summer. You know, when you're when you have some more time in your hands, when. Uh, I'd love to have any of you come to the school to get a sense of what we do firsthand and how applying certain requirements wouldn't really fit with our school. And that happens with others, perhaps other smaller schools too. And so I wonder how we can address that too. Um, if, if, this, if, you know, what's the, what's the objective of the requirements and how can we meet the objective without necessarily doing it the same way a public school does? Because it, it would really be very different. But if we can be in the same spirit and the same goal, we can meet there to get, get the job done. To, of course, benefiting the kid. Did you testify before House Ed? I did uh, with uh, Drew Gradinger. We did. We did a double. Was that? Are you your House Ed? Right? No, you're. Yeah, you're yeah. So no, I I came to you guys before. I believe I didn't do House Ed. Okay. Drew was in here too. As long. Okay. Uh, related to the bill, CJ, I don't know if this impacts you or not, but the other part that I'm trying to figure out a little bit is the there's something that says we would be, well, let me back up. Last year we passed a bill that said dollars can leave the state only if you are going to school in a bordering state. Uh, and we also said if you are going to, if you're going to a therapeutic school and you're looking for a fit, we weren't concerned about where that therapeutic school might be. It could be California. I mean, whatever the best fit for the kid. We know there are some circumstances where the state can't meet the needs. So what this bill says is it, no dollars can go 25 miles outside of the state. Um, I'm struggling a little bit with the with the mileage. I don't know if we're cutting people off. I don't know. I haven't looked into it carefully enough. Would that impact you guys at all in any way? I mean, you know, do you get students? Because one of the things I want to make sure doesn't happen is we don't want New Hampshire to say, all right, we're not sending kids to Linden, to St. John's Barry, or New York. You know, there are some of these relationships out there. You don't have any of those with other states. That doesn't impact us. I think it's a good thing to be looking at because I I think the Vermont kids should have that option when they're on the, the border. I'm sorry, my ear thing keeps falling out. It does not impact Rock Point, but I think it's a good thing to keep to be able to have our Vermont kids go. So, so just to confirm, you have no students from out of state on an IEP that are being paid for by the state, like New Hampshire, Maine, nothing like Correct. that. Okay, great. Yeah. Senator, uh, no, no, no. questions. Okay, just put that into my colleague. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? So um, we, go ahead. You know, I, I did, you know, you're not asking about the 2200 rules, but uh, when that first came in, I was thinking like, ah, oh, can I do that then also? Because uh, it's special ed dollars. Mm -hmm. But talking with the AOE and talking with our lawyer, they said, you know, just be in good relationship with the LEA and be clear about who you serve. Because the LEA, if we can work in concert, they're, gonna, they're not going to send a kid to a place where they're going to, be set up to fail like they, and that's the collaboration piece i think is really good the the uh the uh, 483 upped the bar and changed it and made it more intense um so i think it's just how can we collaborate more and and be an open dialogue to best serve the young person not it's not about me filtering kids out it's about me making sure with the lea that we got the right mat the right skill set to serve that kid so that's that's where i hope to put our energy So we're going to go through the bill uh, section by section, but I, you know this this is one of those pieces that might get pulled, it might stay in, depending on how committee members feel. Uh, but you're saying, from your perspective, it's important to keep to to not have it in. You want to continue to make sure that interview happens, the campus tour, et cetera. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. How many students at Rock Point? At Rock Point, 
currently it's 32. We have between 25 and 35. We could have up to 40, really. We have 32 right now. Of the 32, eight are um, being t paid by district funds. Anything else? Okay. Really appreciate it, CJ. I appreciate your thoughtfulness and your time, and I, I hope it can change in the bill. If it can't, as with Martine, I do hope that there could be a grandfather clause so the kids who are here are able to finish their schooling. Um, you know, I, I'm already looking at trying to find other ways, revenues to support them, but we'll cross that bridge when we need to after you finish your work. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Take care. So we'll look at a Friday the interview process. Do you want to keep it in, uh, pulling it, or keep, I mean, and just get some thoughts. We've had some testimony now on interview piece. We've already done a walkthrough on this, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, to CJ's point, I, I understand why certain schools need to interview. They're, they're filling niches. They're not, they're not trying to be generic schools. I think that's important for both parties to evaluate each other. We're all following the one size fits all. I know. <clears throat> I, I agree with that. Yeah. And then as an addendum, how, on top of that, how do we make it so that moving moving beyond the you know filling a niche part how do we prevent discrimination how do we prevent people from saying you know you, you can't come to the school for well, x did, y and z reasons that are didn't uh, uh 2200 take care of that I mean, we already have laws and books about yeah. non-discrimination right. i don't think we need another no. set of identical laws mm -hmm. it's just my, i think we've taken care of that yeah. but if i'm wrong please highlight But the interview process, even the 25 mile thing, is just seems, you know, the 25 mile thing is a little bit arbitrary. There's a 28 mile school uh, up in uh, Quebec that's servicing a Northern Kingdom community. It's 28 miles, okay. It just seems like a, somebody just pegged a, pegged a distance that seemed reasonable at the time without doing research. That's all. You want it to be 30 miles? <laughs> No, to be frank, I think we need to look at where the schools serve, and if there's, yeah. you know, if, if it's, you know, if it's reasonable that 30 is the answer because of that 28 school, 28 mile school. Good. What, what I would really like to make sure that we end is sending kids to foreign countries yeah. on mm -hmm. public dollars, so including Canada. Um, yeah, you know, if 483 doesn't go anywhere. I'd at least like to see that go into the miscellaneous bill, if possible. It's absurd to me that we send public dollars to Sweden and Japan for a school. France. Yeah, France and Netherlands. Yeah, we got rid of it last year. You know, the house didn't pick it up, but we did that also. And we grandfathered in, of course, those kids just so they could finish. So yeah. We have more testimony on 483 coming? Yeah, we've got, do uh, you have Senator Felix uh, witness? Yeah, and if we need to fill some time up, I, I just, uh, you know, I want to bring it back to um, equity. And we know the social determinants of health and how your success in this country is very much based on where you live. And I have a whole bunch of students in my district who live in poverty, who are new Americans, who can't afford to move to Land Grove so that their parents can fly them to Switzerland to go to school. This is an equity issue. I think it's really important if, we, if we're going to be this state that claims to be taking care of our people, all, and when I say our people, I'm talking about the most marginalized and vulnerable, then we need to make some changes. And that is one, I just want to echo what Senator Hashim just said, that is just extremely inequitable. Because you're setting up some people to succeed and some people to fail right off the bat. Well, let, let me, I'm going to back up just a step, just because I, I don't think we all know what this whole international school uh, cost is all about, like who these people are. You know, most likely they're Vermont residents. They're working overseas somewhere. Okay. It could be that, could be that the, the students are in a school near their parents, but, but the parents are paying Vermont taxes and property tax. I mean, I did. I did that for freaking 15 years. And I, 
but not. I'm but paying I didn't. property. I'm paying tax to fix the roads in Brattleboro, and I don't live in Brattleboro. This is what we do as a state. We support each other as a community. I, I know that, but but there's a cap on the. All I'm saying is I don't think we know enough about the overseas for people to really cast stones up. I really don't think we do. It, no, does, I, it I, doesn't sound good. I know some of the families who've used it in the past. Okay, okay. Well, that, you know, maybe if that were you know, a contentious element that we bring somebody in that can talk sure. about yeah. why. Yeah. Not That's from where I live. Yeah. No, no, and not from where I live, but from, I, I can name the towns. I won't, but um, well, any, any, any choice town. Yeah. In the state. Anyway. It's just, I don't know, I think it's a little disingenuous since we're having an open conversation until Aaron gets here to, to be talking about like the right fit for the kid. Because I could easily say, well, my kids, the right fit would have been a ski school in Zermatt, Switzerland. That would have been the right fit for my kids. I mean, is that is that where we're at? That everyone's going to get the right fit? I think the right question fit? would probably be asked to somebody like CJ. What did he mean? Not, not us, because we're not in that. I, I, I would disagree with part of that. I mean, you know, it's, I mean, this is going back to the bullying, you know, harassment issues. You know, it's, there, there are some independent schools that are picking up where public schools are failing, which is, you know, providing niche services for kids who are, you know, experiencing these sorts of things and not getting the resources that they need in that it's public not, school. It's not a conversation we're having right now that we're talking about going overseas to private No, I thought you were talking about equity. I, yeah. I'm trying to talk about equity. Okay, I was, I was unclear what, so disregard, I guess. I just think the overseas bit, again, minor, minor subset of Vermont citizens. There might be more of a story there than we recognize. Doesn't sound good, I, I agree with you 100%. But we haven't heard from them, so we can't right. can't really speak you know intelligently about that. Did you want to say anything else about equity and bullying? No, I, I I think I was just got distracted and thought we were talking about something else. So well, it's all connected. I mean, it's it's it's, yeah. it's in a way it's all connected. I, in in my mind, I, I think the the overseas bit for me it's it's an easy call. I mean, I. I, I, I wouldn't like the fact that you know, if I'm paying tax dollars for somebody to go to a fancy school in Switzerland. I, I just don't think it makes sense. Uh, you know, if you're living overseas and you want to send your kid, I mean, and that's, that's the other thing. If you're living overseas, but you have the residence in Vermont, and then you're using that residence to get other taxpayers to pay for your kid to go to school where you're currently living overseas, yeah, but they're paying Vermont taxes. Yeah. But, and they're well, paying Vermont property taxes. And there are public schools they could be sending their kids to here in the state. They may not live or are they paying non-resident taxes or resident? I'm just saying that I'm just saying that it's a, it's an odd scenario. I don't think we really understand it. Uh, I, I agree with you that at first blush, it should you know it's it's a problem. It should be uh, corrected. But I'm just telling you, I don't I don't feel like we know enough about it to just like we don't know enough about whether it's 25 miles or 28 miles, we just don't. And it's difficult to you know put a black line through and say no, it's not not appropriate. So it sounds like we're we're talking about the bill. Do yeah. we do we amend it, that, or do we just say no? There's too many glitches. There. Well, it sounds like we're going to amend it one way or the other. Sure. And we've got we'll hear from we we'll hear from some parents, we're hearing from other people, we're hearing from special educators, etc. This week, so. By the end of the week, I think we'll have a good idea of where the committee is on each of these. I mean, for me, as I've said, the big piece is the anti-discrimination piece, the special education piece. And I do think there are, there is a home. I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all. I do think that for certain kids, certain schools are a better fit, like a pop point in some cases could be yep. saving a kid's life. Okay, Ready? Aaron McGuire, please. Okay. Over Amiga. Over Amiga. Over Amiga. That's school. I don't know if that would work. My kids would have been happy there too. They make nice little wooden statuettes. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, you could fly your Hi, Ms. McGuire. How are you? Hi. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Thanks okay. for joining us. Sure, happy to be with you. I'm sorry I'm not in person. Um, I am away, and so I'm hoping that my internet works just fine, and it is possible that it could be a little bumpy. So if that happens, uh, just please do let me know. Um, but so far, so good, hopefully. So far, so great, and, and thank you. I realize you're away. This is probably your vacation week. I really cannot thank you enough for taking the time to come before us, in addition to everything else you're doing, so. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, great. So uh, H483, uh, Senator Gulick thought you might be able to give us some thoughts and some ideas on the bill. For sure. sure. Thank Thanks you. for inviting me. Good to Good see, to see all, all of you. Of you. Uh, I'm uh, grateful to have an opportunity to talk with all of you. you. Um, I am I hopeful am that hopeful you'll feel free to engage me in a conversation. A conversation. I will I certainly will share, share some, some thoughts, thoughts with you today, today that I hope will be helpful and then always happy to answer questions as well. I think it's always hopeful for people to know who I am and do a brief introduction. So for those of you that I don't know, I am currently serving as the Director, as the Director of, of Equity, Equity and Inclusion, and inclusion as well as, as the Co-Director of Student of Support Services, Services for the Essex Westford West School District. District. That means I do all DEI work, work, work as well as special education and 504 disability services and really much more in public education in Vermont. Even EWSD, which is considered large in Vermont, is relatively small and many of us wear many hats. I also um, have been through the presidency of the Vermont Council of Special Education Administrators, and I currently serve as the past president of the National Organization for Special Education Directors. So I'm the past president of CASE, which is the Council of Administrators of Special Education. I did talk to Beth Cobb, our superintendent, before I came to speak to you today, and so she does know that I'm testifying. Um, and if I were to be uh, sort of associated in this testimony with any particular group, it probably would be the Essex Westford School District, but I like to share those kinds of things so that you know the spaces that I'm in and the information that I have to share. And actually, this particular topic really, um, I'm, I'm informed by my length of years in education in Vermont using independent schools for special education purposes. Um, as well as interacting with the four academies and other private schools um, in Vermont. But I also have done a fair amount of work on um, private schools and the voucher systems that are happening all across the nation. And so I do bring a little bit of a national perspective to you on this dynamic of using public funds in private space. It is something that happens a fair amount in Vermont. We certainly have public-private partnerships. That's sort of a term I like to use to describe them um, in a number of different areas. I think um, Vermont you know, has a history of that, certainly in public schools as well as in early child care we now have that design um, and you know we even have it in the mental health system where the designated agency um, system in vermont is you know the agency of human services is asking 501c3s to provide mental health services in vermont so i'm hoping to talk with you a little bit about a systems level of thinking because i think it's really important that um, that lens is brought to the table we can talk a lot about vermont Vermont is unique. There are a lot of pieces of us that um, I'm so proud of and, and live in Vermont for those reasons. And I do think it's helpful sometimes to look outside of ourselves, right, at the national landscape where we are having a design that many other states uh, have been engaged in um, around vouchering students to private schools. We don't talk a lot about it that way here, but I, am, I do want to sort of touch that because I feel like for me to make comment today, I do want to make sure that I um, am in a space where I can bring to you the, right the best of my thinking, and that's often how I think about it in other spaces, is really using public funds in private space. So thanks for letting me do that intro. Um, let's talk specifically about 483. Um, I, I do think generally it is a, a step forward for sure related to how we as a public 
institution looking to educate our students in Vermont the best way we know how for their futures. Um, you know, I, I think it's a step forward if we are going to use public funds in private spaces to educate students. I'm an equity director, so what that means is that I come with a very clear sense of ensuring that not only do students not experience discrimination, but they, but they also, also get, get to live, to live their, their best, best selves, selves whenever, whenever we do anything in the context of public school delivery. delivery. We, don't we don't want identity, identity to interfere. And as a matter of fact, we want identity to always be a strength for everyone, no matter what that identity is, right? So if we're thinking about students from uh, the LGBTQ community and wanting to make sure that they are able to live the best, their best life in every aspect without interference from discrimination or harm around their gender identity, making sure that racism is not um, perpetrated by our public institutions. And I do think that obviously Carson B. Macon, right, indicated that religion is uh, cannot be a reason not to engage with a private school for purposes of provision of public funds if you do that otherwise, and Vermont does that, right? We do provide tuition vouchers to um, private schools. And so we cannot deny a private school now that is a religious school simply because of religion. Um, I will say though, that there's certainly an intersection between challenges for the LGBTQ community and some religious spaces, not all of them, but some of them. And it is very important to me and to a lot of people in this state and probably you all sitting here too, that students don't have experiences using public funds that are discriminatory in any way. And I think that's part of what H483 um, brings to you as an opportunity to be really clear about that. So I just wanted to offer support about making sure that not only do students not end up discriminated against, but they have full access to anywhere where we're using public funds. I just really do not think that we should ever provide any public funds in any space that is discriminatory um, in an enrollment practice or in a service practice. I mean, you know, even in the mental health system, like I would never want a 501c3 to be designated as a DA and then be able to only serve certain populations. I, that would just not be okay. And so I think um, 483 really kind of helps us move forward if we are going to maintain a voucher and private school design for public education in Vermont. Um, you know, I, I, I want to just also appreciate some of the creativity and the ways in which education is delivered in some of the private schools in Vermont. You know, I, I am not here to disparage that group of people. I've worked with many of them. Um, I will say though, that those spaces do not comply with a lot of the expectations that your body puts into public school. And I think it's important that we just stop and ask ourselves whether your expectations are only for some students or whether they really all for are for all students. Because there are um, some things that private schools are not responsible for related to accountability practices, uh, related to curricular expectations, related to MTSS, thinking about the um, amazing implementation of Act 173, it's been hard. Not here to say it's easy. I'm not here to say it's perfect, um, but you know, I, you know the the um, in my work, I'm working actually with a a, a private school now that um, is seeking to really lift up their MTSS and their design through the lens of Act 173. But it's it's a very different landscape in that space. It just you know we've grown our public system to be what it is today. And um, that space has not been required to do those same things. So that landscape looks different. I think I also just wanna end by uh, saying that the, um, the way that we hold ourselves, public schools and private schools who use public funds accountable, I think we need to be thoughtful about how we do that. The stories that you all hear matter. So sometimes you are hearing incredible stories 
about private schools in Vermont that are doing amazing work with students. And I want to be careful about this conversation dismissing that. Those are real stories. They matter. Those are students, right, who, uh, who are maybe having their needs met really well in a certain place. Um, but I think it's important that while we look at um, the, the stories that we hear and the, what I'll describe as qualitative data, when you hear a story, that's a, that's a data set, and you hear a qualitative data set, I think it's important that we balance that with both qualitative and quantitative, as well as positive and negative qualitative data. Um, if you look across the nation around the experiences of students in the United States through voucher systems into private schools, we see a whole range of experience, um, both positive and negative. And I think we see that here in Vermont too. For me, it's more about a systems lens, right? We don't legislate off stories. We want to make sure that we think holistically about the systems that we implement and they're what's best for everyone. Um, and I do think that our current design in reference to the public private partnership where we provide public school through private schools in Vermont, needs a lens you know we need to look at it carefully and we should apply an equity lens it's important that we do not see discriminate discriminatory practices or lack of access in the same way that we wouldn't see a lack of access in public schools because then then we go down a road that doesn't match what we espouse to be where we believe is the right direction. So I think those are the things that I wanted to share about uh, 483 sort of from a systemic lens. I am supportive of the bill. I think that it is a good step forward towards some of the things that I've described that can be problematic. And I hope that, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions about independent schools from a special ed lens or um, or other questions that the committee might have. And, and thanks for giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts with you. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Questions for Ms. McGuire. Senator Weeks. Uh, thank you, um, Irene. I, I, uh, Aaron. Obviously. Aaron. Oh, Aaron. Right. Okay. So, so sorry. Hey, so you know, clearly you've got a great deal of uh, experience in this field, and, and certainly um, you're providing some, some excellent insights. So I'm, I'm curious, though, what your thoughts are on the implementation, the intent and implementation of the 2200 series. If you think that that was a you know appropriate, solid move, and then the gaps between the 2200 series and the, and the potential. Um, uh, 483 bill. How is 483 bill? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, I I think that private schools needing to implement a full complement of special education services and 173, you know, and within the context of MTSS, like really being a robust provision of services to meet the intent of what we've asked for under Rule 2200 in, in the special education rules series and its totality. And then I also think about the reasons that Act 46 came forward. <clears throat> Small institutions have a hard time providing what our legislature has expected of educational delivery by itself. It's why we consolidated educational entities into larger entities with, you know, um, really not being able to have schools of 140 or 200 students and be able to meet all of the demands and the needs that we've said are essential in public ed. So I think that what we've asked for to happen is appropriate and I think it needs to happen. I also think that private schools individually doing everything on their own is, I understand why that's become a challenge. You know, I think it's completely appropriate to expect um, provision of special education. I don't think schools should be able to deny access to students 
who are otherwise appropriately placed under IDEA in a general public school setting, and then that they don't have access to this place where we're providing public funds, it's a private space, and they say, no, sorry, we can't meet your needs. I mean, that just starts to become problematic. So the idea that we expect private schools to provide special education in order to be non-discriminatory since we provide public funds into those spaces, I think is essential. I also have a great deal of empathy for small um, private schools trying to function as public schools inside of the current design. And again, that is why Act 46 came forward, because it's very difficult to meet all of the requirements that you would need to meet to provide the high level of education that we in Vermont expect for our students. If the only populace is 146 students, and it's just that school only doing all of the things that need to be done, including provision of a free appropriate public education for students with disabilities. So it's not totally surprising to me that it's been a real challenge. And um, I think that if we are going to maintain a private public partnership with private schools to provide public education in Vermont, that they need to be able to serve students under the federal law uh, as students with disabilities who have a least restrictive environment of the general ed setting, they need to be able to do that. How we do that, what that looks like, is 2200, did it, did it sort of thread the needle exactly as it needed to? I think you'll hear different perspectives depending on what people are contending with. Um, but I, I do know that it is definitely challenging for private schools to be able to do all of that, that body of work. Um, does that help answer the question yeah, that you asked? Yeah, it does. I appreciate that. Just a little more specifically, do you feel that the 2200 series uh, did an adequate job of addressing the LBGTQ community that you raised at the beginning of your briefing? You know, um, the idea that open enrollment is present and non-discriminatory practice is expected is appreciated. I don't think that we go far enough when we create a floor of non-discrimination. So as an equity director, I think that there is more to do than make sure people don't experience discrimination. I think that's like kind of your basic floor of what should be expected. I think that um, really protecting people who often experience discrimination is a very important job. And I, I definitely would prefer to see higher levels of expectation than non-discrimination, but I also understand the limitations of a legislative body. Uh, to some degree as well. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure the exact specific language that you're asking me about in Rule 2200. And so um, if you would like to read the specific language, I might have a, a more to add, um, but I would just say that generally speaking for me, non-discrimination is a floor that for me is like a non-negotiable. Um, and I would expect uh, that there wouldn't be differential treatment, that there would be an, a welcoming and excitement about people with differences. I believe that difference is a strength. Difference is, is, is an amazing opportunity um, of all kinds. And I, I uh, am not sure how, if, if 2200 is played out in that lens or not, I wanna be careful about speaking about things I'm not sure about. So um, would wanna be careful about that, but is there a specific set of words that you'd like to read to me from oh, that? Space? No, I don't. No, I don't. I just, uh, I was curious your basic impression. Thank you. Yeah. The sure. 2200 series, just so you know, Aaron, <clears throat> it's, there's anti-discrimination language in there that says no public dollars can go to a school unless they follow the, you know, the anti-discrimination policy and they put it on their website, things like that. And I think it's safe to say, I agree absolutely that it's more than just an anti-discrimination policy, and I would say that's true with our public schools as well, as we have heard in this okay. committee, absolutely. Like, how do we beef them up and give them the supports that they need to make sure that students feel safe and welcome? Yes, I agree with you completely. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. Yes, I agree. Hi, Aaron. I had a quick question for you um, that I asked of CJ Spirito earlier, but neither of us came up with an answer. Um, 
we're hearing from some small private schools that aren't therapeutic, but that help kids that might have mental health needs or are differently abled. Um, do you, out of curiosity, do you know what other states do? Because um, we're being told that some of these kids can't be served in the public schools, so that's why they go to these small um, schools. Uh, do you, like Massachusetts, for example, do you have any sense of what they might do? Yeah, I, I don't know specifically Massachusetts, Martine, but I think it's worth having, I'll just walk through a little bit of the independent private school design in special education um, and uh, whether or not the school is or is not approved under Vermont rules to provide special education, the lens of focusing in on um, particular populations of students through what we would might describe as a therapeutic lens. Vermont has a very long history of using special education dollars to um, meet the needs of students who are struggling to be able to have a least restrictive environment in the public school setting for one reason or another under special education. And we've used independent or private schools to actually do that body of work. And I think that's what makes sometimes this conversation also confusing for people because um, that is sort of a subpopulation of private schools, if you will, that do that body of work. Um, I, I there are most states that I'm aware of, and I want to be careful, I think there are plenty of states out there that use a similar model um, that have public schools that have larger continuums of available services. I guess that's the way I would describe it. So, you know, the idea that um, uh, I'll just give you an example. Essex Westford School District does not have right now, although we are looking at changing this um, right now, K eight, we do not have any environment that uh, is specifically for delivery of special education in the context of separation from the classroom, right? Most states have uh, special education classrooms or schools where students who with like needs can have their needs met on a continuum. That is, there is less and less of, there's there's less of that in Vermont than there is in other places, <clears throat> in my opinion, which makes us rely on these independent private schools much more strongly. It is my opinion that public schools do need to increase their capacity to be able to increase their continuum of care. I don't think though that that means that we won't require very specialized um, service provision in a, a, a more contained setting for some students. And again, you know, we are small, we're a small state. And so the idea that we would benefit our state by thinking about the private public partnership to help build capacity in very specific circumstances where public schools cannot provide the services, but you know you build out a small environment that can really do that well and do it for you know uh, this part of the state or that part of the state. You know, Chittenden County is a is a relatively large place, and you can build a school that will will provide those services there. And people will use them, but I, it is my opinion that public schools need to increase their own capacity to do some of this work rather than using sort of those separate settings that are private or independent in Vermont. Um, again, that's not to say I want independent or private schools to close that are doing that now, um, but I uh, that is a different conversation than the reason those schools are closing. There are some schools that are closing, they're expressing an inability to do the work based on implementation of the um, school approval process and the amount of tuition they're allowed to charge to public schools. So that's kind of a separate issue. And Martine, I don't know if that's something that you wanna talk about or not, but generally speaking, I think public schools need to increase their capacity. Yes, there may be a need for some specific delivery of independent school or private schools that can do very specific work with students that are not able to be met in the public school continuum, but I, I think we need to expand our public school continuum. Thank you. Does that make that sense? Helps. Yeah, yeah. I need to do some research because I am curious about what other states are doing. 
Um, yeah, I mean, they're they're definitely they have their own schools that uh, separate schools that will provide those services to students in a lot of other states that are related uh, to the public to the district. Okay. Yeah, that are that are owned by the district. I mean, that exists in Vermont too. There are school districts that have separate programs in separate right. buildings that run a school <clears throat> specifically to meet certain students' needs. Yeah, we've got yeah. that in Burlington actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you the the idea of doing it is certainly something that we can do. Uh, there's just a very, you know, we contend in Vermont with the way things grew versus the way we would build things today. Right. Probably that happens everywhere. Um, but the way this has all grown up is that we have built a private public partnership to do this body of work instead of building it out inside of public systems. Is that the right decision? Is that the wrong decision? I think that's actually your question. Like, where where do we want these services and this body of work happening for our students? Do we want it inside of private space or do we want it in public space? Or are we supportive of the private public partnership? And if so, what are the requirements? Right. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Sure. And really great of you again to zoom in while you're away. Happy, Happy to do it. Do it. Any Anything else for the good of the afternoon? afternoon. I think Anything we're else? good. Okay. okay. All right. Great. I hope it's sunny great. and nice wherever you are. Yeah. <laughs> Thank good. you. you All right. Care, nice Bye bye. All right. All right. Let's take a 10 minute break and we'll come back and pick up with, I believe, Ms. Barquist. Right. Thank you. Thanks to your families and friends. Good watch from home. We are back on Senate Education Tuesday, April 25th, 309. Ms. Barquist, you've asked to weigh in on the language that uh, Bo Yang put forward um, to add to the miscellaneous education bill. And if you were here earlier, you would hear that the committee is still struggling a little bit on this. We heard, uh, I'm glad Ms. Zaglowski is here, she mentioned. And Ms. Zaglowski, to confirm, you were representing that day the NEA, everybody was saying, don't move forward. Yeah, the, four associations. the four associations. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, and so this has to do with severe and pervasive standard um, of bullying and harassment. So with that, the floor is yours. Yes, Thank well, you. hopefully I won't confuse your decision too much, but maybe offer you some clarity. Um, Jessica Barquist, <coughs> policy director at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. And we strongly support the amendment that was offered to H-461 that will strengthen the bullying and harassment language in our education harassment statute. We are generally supportive of reforms that improve our system responses to has harassment and discrimination at an earlier intercept before victims experience long-range impacts. Harassment based on a student's protected characteristics can have long-term and detrimental impacts to both their mental health and their education. In particular, we want to highlight the importance of this bill in addressing sex and gender-based harassment. Sexual harassment is a form of sexual violence, and this can take many forms, including unwanted, unwanted, unwelcome or unwanted sexual advances and sexually explicit and offensive conduct. These behaviors can create a hostile and abusive educational environment. Last year, we worked with Boryang and others um, to support the efforts to address the severe and pervasive standard in Vermont law. Um, and that is across a number of different settings, employment, housing, public accommodations, and educational. We were pleased to see that harassment standard amended for housing last year. And this year we're working on an amendment for um, that standard in all public accommodations. The severe and pervasive standard, which originates from case law, creates an exceptionally high barrier for individuals to bring forward meritorious claims of sexual or gender-based harassment. Victims and survivors who have experienced long-range discrimination or a singular severe instance of harassment have been prevented from bringing forth claims due to the standard. As with many forms of sexual violence, individuals occupying more than one marginalized identity, such as race or gender identity, are impacted by issues of harassment in much more complex ways. Under the severe and pervasive standard, students with intersecting identities must prove that they were subject to severe or pervasive harassment on each separate basis. 
The totality of all harassing behavior and its impact cannot be adequately addressed with the current standard. S-103 is currently being considered in the House, and that would change the severe and pervasive standard in employment and other places of public accommodation, with the exception of educational settings. And if we are to change the severe and pervasive standard for employment while carving out educational settings, school employees subject to harassment and discrimination will be treated differently than students. And just to underscore this, that, that schools will become safer for their employees than for students. So if the same teacher sexually harasses both a colleague and a student, um, that adult, that colleague, the other teacher will have more protections from that harassment than the student, than the child. Many states of public accommodation, including healthcare settings and prisons, have statutory and institutional policies already regarding harassment and discrimination. And while it is true that we are expecting new Title IX regulations to come out, hopefully in the next year or so, um, those represent the minimum standard of protections that institutions must offer. Vermont can and should do more to offer students protection from harassment and discrimination. Students deserve the right to pursue a claim for harassment under the Public Accommodations Act. And uh, there were two very impactful examples presented in the House last week, which I'd like to share with you uh, related to how this standard hurts our students. So MH was a ninth grade student in New York when a classmate attacked her in a stairwell, pressing her against the wall with all of his weight and groping her all over her body. While she tried to push him off and told him to get off, this was very clearly a sexual assault. But a federal court held that the sexual assault was not severe enough because she was not raped. Nine federal, uh, in other words, the court said that any sexual assault that is not rape is not severe enough. And then uh, a female student in Georgia from the 10th grade when an older student forced her to perform sexual acts on the school ground. The federal court said the act happened in only a single incident, so it was not pervasive enough because she was not attacked on two separate occasions. Many other pause, courts- If you would pause right there for a second. <clears throat> so under, if these happened in Vermont right now, what, and, and we did pass this amendment, and then they happened. This is allowing a student to do what that he or she wouldn't be able to do under current law? Yeah, uh, um, so this amendment doesn't hold students liable for harassment. Right. Um, it holds the schools liable. Okay. And so it allows students to receive those supports and protections that they need, um, but it doesn't dictate how schools should follow up on that discrimination or require a certain disciplinary to take action. Um, and if it did, we would not be supporting it. Um, and, and just for context, there are many ways for schools um, to be able to address this harassment without discipline. Uh, first and foremost, schools should provide victim-centered responses. And that means offering supportive measures to help the harassed victim feel safe at school, like a safety plan so they don't have to be in the same classroom as their harasser, or um, figuring out so they don't have to run into their harasser in the hallways, or at recess, lunch, um, or on a bus. If a harassed victim starts skipping school because they are afraid of seeing their harasser, a school can excuse those absences instead of making them truant. If their grades have gone down or they are having trouble studying or learning, the school can give the student a tutor to help them catch up on schoolwork or an extension for their homework. Um, you know, if there are so many different ways that uh, the school can offer supportive measures. Um, and even for the, the harasser, right, the, um, there are many things outside of discipline that the school can do uh, to connect them to a mental health counselor to help them understand to help them with past abuse or trauma in their life. Um, the, the idea here is that the schools are liable to do something to address the harassment instead of do nothing. Can you say a word about elementary versus middle versus high school students? Everybody treated the same way or the school is held accountable in the same way? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't, I have some statistics here for you that are mostly older students, um, but yes, I think all students should have the right to a school environment free from harassment or discrimination. Um, and just to give you some of those statistics, data collected by the U.S. Department of Ed, about one in five U.S. students ages 12 to 18 have been bullied between 2015 and 2019. One in four students uh, bullied between 2018 and 2019 were bullied due to their race, national origin, sexual orientation, religion, disability, or gender. Additional data from 2021 detailing the impacts of the pandemic found that the risks for sexual and identity-based harassment disproportionately impact students of color, girls, and LGBTQIA students. Vermont schools are not immune to harassment and its harmful impact on students according to results from the Vermont 2019 Youth Risk Behavior Survey, 45% of students have been bullied on school property. Feelings sad and hopeless increased among Vermont high school students from 25 to 31% and among middle school students from 19 to 23%. There was an increase in the number of high school students who hurt themselves without wanting to die. That went from 16 to 19. Uh, made a suicide plan from 11 to 13 percent and attempted suicide up to 7 percent from 5 percent. So this legislation essentially just puts more tools in the toolbox for adults to help protect our, our children in our school systems. Um, and by amending the education code to amend that severe or pervasive standard, you all would send a message to Vermont residents that harassment based on sex, race, disability, religion, age, whatever, uh, will always be taken seriously, regardless of where it occurs. And probably, possibly even most importantly, you will be helping to educate kids at a very young age that harassment in any place is not acceptable. And this will help to ensure not just safer schools, but safer workplaces and safer public places for all Vermonters. So thank you so much for squeezing me in today and for your time and attention on this. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Just one. Uh, on uh, the second page, you have a comment on uh, school liability. And it says uh, this amendment doesn't hold students liable for harassment or discrimination. It holds schools liable. I'm just wondering if the intent of that sentence is a positive or a negative effect. It's a positive. I think there um, uh, have been some, some testimony in Metro Business Committee or in another committee grappling with these issues that um, concern that the end result would be that students would end up being expelled or. Um, you know, further widening their gap of support services. Um, and so what I was trying to say there is that this places the onus on the school to address the situation versus placing the onus on the student causing the harassment or with any sort of disciplinary measures. Okay, so I just wanted, while you're here, just curious if you can comment on where the student and parents' responsibility begins. I mean, I think that um, the parents and students do have a responsibility, but that the school also has a responsibility to support them in that education. And that's part of what we do in schools is we learn from our mistakes. And the school needs to be able to support the students and the family in being able to go through that process. Zilowski, do you mind just weighing in again on this? This is starting, as I read it, it's starting to sound much more reasonable to me than my initial, initial thought. Can you just say again why you're opposed to this? Why you, the NEA superintendents, you can say right there, no, seriously. <laughs> my testimony on Friday was not that we are opposed to it. Okay. Our, my testimony was that we our, our testimony is that you should wait until the federal Title IX regulations are issued because yeah. they cover uh, a lot of the same areas that this uh, amendment does. And I think it'll be helpful for you to hear from attorney Heather Lynn. She's up next on your yeah. witness list, and I think she'll be able to go into a little bit more um, detail on that. But even if, even if the feds come back and say 
June or whenever, saying this is fine. Why not get this started? What if they come back and not? Ms. I think that. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you dropping that? Well, I was going to. Uh, yeah, I will just um, comment that. Um, you all have already passed S-103, and it is up in the house yeah. that is likely to pass around um, employment, yeah. changing this. So schools are places of employment, and they will have to change their policies anyway as it results to their employees. Right. So they S103. will already be updating these policies regardless of when or what comes from Title IX. For teachers and staff. Personnel. Yes, Senator. Uh, so I'm just looking on page two, and then there's a statement of, while well, it's true, we're expecting new Title IX regulations to come out in the next year or so. They represent the minimum standard of protections that institutions must offer. Do you have any details on the differences that would be created if we were to pass this amendment and then compared to what Title IX changes would come down the road? Do you know what? Okay. There's no such thing as a draft that's been circulated. It, there is, and my colleague Harry Brown might have more information. Ms. Brown, do you want to say, introduce yourself here? Harry here. Brown, executive director of the Vermont Commission on Women. Um, the, the, the proposed changes are available. They are expected to come out very soon. Um, in judging by past history, generally speaking, the, the final regulations that come out after a period of public comment tend to match the proposal, and there's no guarantee that they actually will. But, so we have a pretty good idea of what they say. Um, so the, the Agency of Education will need to be making changes to their model policies on hazing, harassment, and bullying because of the Title IX changes that are definitely coming. So that is... Which are, can you tell us, I mean, that's, I think, what we're trying to get at. What's coming? Oh, what's, what's in is it, Does it look like what we're trying to do right here, or is it less? No, it's, it's <clears throat> less. It's, um, there are a lot of things in there that have to do with like, timing and procedure and that kind of thing. They are using still the severe or pervasive standard as a basis. And so in that sense, it is not providing the same level of protection as this um, change would. That, so to bring S103 to match what's going on with education. So it, it, it's, a, it's a lower standard of protection, if you will. The Agency of Education will be revising their model policies in response to the Title IX changes. And so if we don't make these changes now to the education law and make them later, then it will be a two different revision procedures that will have to happen. So if, the, if revision needs to happen, it, is, it makes a lot more sense to do it all at the same time if this is the standard that you want. Yeah, that's, that's exactly, as, as you, thank you for that. That's one of my concerns too now is the, the two different revisions um, is what it, it just wouldn't really make sense to do that in my opinion uh, because if, if we're talking about waiting until Title IX and then having AOE revise their rules twice, it just seems like a waste of resources and a waste of time if we can do something that's stronger for, for students. Senator okay. Gillis. What do you think? I, I mean, I've, you, you've heard what I've had to say. Yeah. I am just, um, I, I'm concerned that there may be some um, in unanticipated consequences for some of our most vulnerable students. Um, I'm prepared to be proven wrong. I hope I, to a certain extent, I hope I am. But I would just ask that we have some folks from our equity office come in to speak to this in Burlington and maybe in Winooski and maybe even in Essex as well. Um, in Colchester, you know, just some of these schools. I'd love to hear from them um, and what, what they have to say. And I, I, I hope I'm off base. I just don't want Would you work with Aiden and just sure. bring in a couple more witnesses yeah. tomorrow? That would be well, great this Thursday. week is tough because it is school break. So mm -hmm. people are away, but I'll try. Yeah, that'd be yeah. great if we could okay. try to move this. Um, Senator Gulick's the unintended consequences piece. Ms. Bark was, I, I, can you say something about that? Do you? How are you feeling about that? Because one of the things that the committee talked about last week was, what if a student were uh, autistic, said something um, inappropriate, meant no harm? What if somebody were, you know, was just 
going about learning what life is like, and we don't want to jeopardize Absolutely. their future in any way. I, I can totally appreciate those uh -huh. concerns. Um, and I think that's why I said that if this bill dictated um, disciplinary measures for the harasser, we would not support that. Um, but what we're hopeful that this amendment does is allows the school, um, because even if the, the person who said um, the harassing comment um, you know, it was part of their personal learning journey. Um, right, right. That, that harm is still real, and that victim is still deserving of a response from the school and support from the school. And that's what this amendment is trying to do. Yeah, well, I totally agree. Yeah, that's really, that's, that's helpful. Uh, no, I was just scratching my face. Can I say <laughs> Sorry. Can I, and the only other thing I would say, I absolutely, I want victims to be protected. I would also say that, again, Having worked in, in education for a long time, I think a lot of times kids whose behavior is erratic have also suffered trauma and various other travails in their lifetime. So, yeah, and our hope important. is that schools will address that in a trauma informed and sensitive way too, instead of expelling that student, but really working with that student to get the supports they need so that they can be a safe member of our community as well. So, again, in this, there's no disciplinary method measures taken for the harasser. This is more, hey, it was, no matter who said it, how they said it, whether they are right and wrong, we're talking about the person that was harassed, and the school now needs to take steps to make sure that maybe those two people, even if it was unintentional, this person's not feeling great about it, don't interact, you know, have, you know, maybe aren't put on the same team, you know, all those kinds of things to make sure that person yeah, is yeah. Comfortable. Really, and if that doesn't take place, then that's when the school um, could be held accountable. That's Which right. leads me to ask, what does accountability look like? That is not a question I feel prepared to answer, but I can um, do some more research on my colleagues who have been working on this a little bit more detailed than I have. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that back. Generally, you know, we're not in. Rarely, are we in the fining business? Are we in the? You know, so what does that look like? That would be, that would be I believe helpful. it's a civil process uh -huh. where the students can um, address harms that have happened, but I will make sure I have that accurate for you. Yeah, essentially it's saying the, the schools have to address it instead of sweeping it under the rug yeah. or pretending it's not existing. Yeah. Senator Kulik. Do we have to go? It's okay. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I would say, to, well, one other thing really, um, is that if we are to do this, I would just, again, given the capacity of our schools right now, we've heard over and over and over again that they're lacking staff, they're lacking capacity, they're last, lacking resources, then maybe we have an implementation timeline. And again, I'm not, I would want to hear from schools, but maybe some kind of a timeline for them to get, get there. I don't know, I'm just throwing, I'm throwing that out as a possibility. A couple years, I don't know. We'd have to hear from them. I mean, my just initial is a lot of stuff could happen in a couple of years, and we're about trying to improve the lives of kids, and I know you are as well, and it's just, you know, it's, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Wish our next headlines here. Great. So on the same topic, Heather Lynn. been listening in Ms. Lynn, but we've uh, we just had some testimony from the uh, Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence on this bill, and I, I think that testimony helped at least me personally better understand what it would do and how it would do it, um, And but we know that you sent along some concerns. So if you would yeah. be so kind as to share those concerns after you introduce yourself, that would be great. Thank you. My name is Heather Lynn. I'm an attorney. I work out of Burlington, Vermont. I was born and raised in Vermont. 
and I have worked with school systems for over 20 years, focused on responding to inappropriate student conduct, whether it rises to a level of harassment using bullying or other areas of code of conduct violations. And uh, just a little additional background on what I do. Uh, I'm appearing here um, on behalf of the Vermont School Board Insurance Trust, and my connection to that organization is one that also stretches 20 years. In my work, what I do on a weekly basis, year-round, is on any given day, you can see on my calendar, time set aside for me to do a training or a seminar on harassment, hazing, bullying, the definitions, a deep dive on the process that schools must follow when that information that relates to conduct that might, and that is the standard, might be HHB, not it's absolutely true, not we've proven it, is we think it may be going on, then schools automatically are compelled already under current law to document what is known, to get that information to a building administrator and have that building administrator assess the information, lining it up with the standards with a generous approach to meeting that standard and lean in under the standard that is under the Vermont Agency of Education's current procedures, their model procedures for the prevention of harassment, hazing, and bullying, mandate when that information lands on the administrator's desk, if that information provides them with just merely reasonable belief that a policy violation may have occurred, they shall investigate that information. And then the investigation will look into what has happened, surrounding circumstances, surrounding facts, an understanding of the dynamic that may have been at play and at work, and then find whether or not the policy was violated, and if not, well, did something else go on that still was disruptive to the educational environment that requires a response by the schools? And so the work that I've been doing for 20 years has been providing schools and the resources to support that work. And you can take a look at those resources if you want. They are available on the BISBIT, and that's B-S-B-I-T yeah. website. Just Google Visit and Toolkit, you will see my work, resources in detail, tailored to administrators, staff and faculty, superintendents, school boards, and within that kit is an itemization of every current duty imposed by law, federal and state, for schools to respond. So with respect and an appreciation of the other perspectives that have been brought in front of the committee, it's simply not accurate to say that schools currently don't have a duty to respond. That duty under Vermont law has existed for over 20 years. The current iteration of the way in which schools respond in detail is contained in AOE's 2015 model procedure. That's what's currently up for review. I've submitted my proposed amendments to the agency. There are loopholes that need you know, fixing, but those procedures tell schools step by step. And forgive me, I train on this so I can, I can get kind of wound up and into the weeds. But I want to turn my commentary now to the topic that is raised by your proposed bill and some of the testimony that you just received, which is around sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is currently prohibited in Vermont schools in two ways, under federal law and under state law. The state law definition is contained in the AOE model policy. There's a policy and then there's a procedure. And if you look at the model policy definition, it indeed does contain the severe, persistent, or pervasive language. However, however, it continues with these words, so as to deny or limit the student's ability to participate in or benefit from the program. 
you will never hear out of my words at any of my trainings or in any consultation with a client, and I do this work all day long. Oh, what you're describing to me is not going to be severe, persistent, or pervasive. I don't even focus on those words. All of the action is on the deny or limit. How much does it take to limit somebody? Just one fraction less than 100%. So what we're looking for when we're considering sexual harassment under Vermont law in schools is, is it having any impact at all? Now, let's take the example where a student is on the receiving end of behavior that is otherwise falling under the category of sexual harassment, but there is no discernible, discreet, or latent impact at all, which it's frankly hard for me to imagine, but let's just put that up there as an exemplar. Can you give us an example? Can you just give a... I, 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 it would be very difficult for me to think of an example of sexual harassment where a student is not feeling some level of right. impact. But if, if that were true, okay. you still, under your current system with no changes, prohibit behaviors in school where you don't need to prove any impact at all. And that is your definition of bullying, which this body enacted back in 2005. And that is a very strict standard, and I, I think it's unique in the country. All that is required is for the behavior to happen more than once. So where a student is on the receiving end of sexual harassment, very typically, there are a cluster of behaviors, but even if there is only one, the student can be fully warned, and then if they engage in, quote, any act that has an intent to ridicule, humility, or intimidate, even if it's not on the basis of sex, and even if there is no discernible impact from that second incident, if it happens in school, bullying has occurred. So we have a constellation of protections under Vermont law. But in addition, I heard from the prior witness the concern that students are often also members of other protected categories. And the suggestion that if that were the case, those other protected category methods of harassment would somehow also require the severe persistent standard, and that's just not accurate. The general definition of harassment, which is in 26A, which is a focus of your bill, 16 BSA, subsection 11, and then 26A, defines harassment generally. There is no severe or pervasive language anywhere in that. So if a student who is a um, member of a minority religion is the target of behaviors and the target of behaviors on the basis of sex. The analysis from the school is not going to be whether or not there was severe, persistent, or pervasive behaviors with respect to the religious-based behavior at all. That standard in 26A, which I outlined in my testimony, and you can review that also at your leisure, looks for one of six potential impacts. Any one of the six will get you over the hurdle. But again, in my example, if they're on the receiving end of behaviors that are based on religion, and also on the receiving end of behaviors on the basis of sex, that's two acts of intentionally demeaning or ridiculing behavior, which gets you to bullying. My point is that there are a lot of obligations under Vermont law which call us to provide protections for students already. My second point relates to federal law. And I heard discussion in the prior witnesses' testimony around how we need to ensure that schools step up and start providing supports to students right away. That already happens and has happened explicitly since 2020 as a result of the first set of Title IX regulations. Those dropped in May 2020 and became effective in August 2020. Once a school has 
any information that sexual harassment might be occurring before even an investigation is launched or even decided to launch, the school shall meet with the victim and provide supportive measures which shall include safety plans, alternative work schedules, alternative settings, escorts if necessary, anything and everything that can reasonably support the student in a way to remove the impact of the harassment, which the school at that point, frankly, operates under a as if it had occurred basis. They don't wait for the end of an investigation to then decide, and now what do we do to help the student? They immediately meet with the victim, and if they're a minor, which is most of the time a parent, and say, we're just presuming for purposes of the conversation this happened. We want to know how is it affecting your access to education right now so that we can close and remove that gap immediately. That must occur under federal law. And any changes the Biden administration makes with their regulations that are dropping in the next couple of weeks will not change that. In fact, they will only increase the duties to provide supportive measures. That's what we've been shown with the proposed rulemaking is that they are increasing the duties and the obligations of the school's Title IX coordinator to redress any sexual harassment that is occurring in the school. So we have a very vibrant network and obligation imposed by federal law right now. In addition, the changes the Biden administration are contemplating do address the severe and pervasive standard. And, and I sent um, to the committee earlier this morning, and I recognize I was supposed to get everything to you a day in advance, but it was this morning that I, I saw that a question had been raised on Friday as to what was the content of those regulation changes. And so I sent to you the summary of major provisions of the DOE's Title IX Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. And under the proposed regulations, they are considering changes to the severe and pervasive standard. I'm looking through my notes, frankly, to find the detail on that precisely. Um, but I, I can also stop and take some questions. I know I've been going on sort of monologue -y and from the video, I can't quite read the room. So uh, I, I, will, I will pause for a second as I look for that citation. <clears throat> Yes, um, it, it, it's actually right on page one on that document where it says that the current regulations prohibit unwelcome sex-based conduct only to do if it is so severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive that it effectively denies equal access. The proposed regulation would cover harassment that creates a hostile environment that is sufficiently severe or pervasive that based on the totality of the circumstances and evaluated subjectively and objectively, it limits or denies a person's ability to participate in or benefit from the program. Much of the testimony that I reviewed centered on concerns that have arisen through the development of the law in the employment law context. And I point that out because the considerations in an employee-employer situation in terms of being able to regulate behavior and set standards for behavior are unique and different than in the education context. When we seek to regulate the behavior of essentially a third party, students are not contractors, they're not direct employees, they're not supervisors imbued with the apparent authority of the school to act and operate on behalf of the school. They come to the school with their own values, their own backgrounds, their own behaviors. And so our ability to regulate their behavior must be tied to the educational environment or educational purpose of the school. For that reason, for example, we know that 
when we attempt to regulate speech through T-shirts or the carrying of insignia and things of that sort, schools are limited, even if those are deeply offensive to other peers in the environment, except where the school can demonstrate that those symbols or those pieces of clothing disrupt the education environment. And what seems to be proposed or is proposed in the current bill would strip away consideration of impacts in the school at all and simply insist that schools find students as having harassed because of motive alone, without consideration of the circumstances, the impacts, and the ongoing dynamic between students. And it's our concern that this is going to, in fact, rebound against expanding rights for the students who you're seeking to help because it's simply going to result in lawsuits filed against schools on constitutional law bases. We have already seen the current procedures and policies attacked in litigation by groups like the Alliance for the Defense of Freedom on a constitutional basis. But until now, none of those have been successful. I have strong concerns that with the change to the law that's proposed in this bill, which would strip away that link with educational performance, access, or indeed environment, it opens the door to successful litigation. And as I always am telling my clients, it is super important if you're protecting students to never have to walk back what you have done. So I have strong concerns that uncoupling those two concepts with the proposed legislation in an effort to address concerns which largely have arisen and existed only in employment law contexts and doesn't take into account the current regulatory structure that we have already in place um, would be misguided. And, and lastly, I will say in the 20 years in which I've been doing this work, the behaviors that I'm seeing coming across my desk and the volume of those behaviors has certainly arisen in the last three years. Um, that is absolutely true. And in conversations with the U.S. Departments of Education Office for Civil Rights that I had just yesterday, I asked them, what are they seeing? And they admitted that they have had more cases filed nationally in the last 12 months than in the history of that office while they're doing the work with 50% less workforce. And my response was, that's what we see too. More issues to handle under these rules with about 50% less people. The turnover in leadership roles in Vermont schools across the state is high. We have early retirements. We have people opting out of the workforce. And so those that remain or those who are taking on these positions need training. And I spend every fall and every spring, I do three three-hour sessions, all this new material. Those are not repeats for hazing, harassment, and bullying. And then another three three-hour sessions on Title IX sexual harassment. And I see a lot of new faces. Those are offered statewide via Zoom. I would welcome any of you if you don't have anything else better to do, and I'm sure you do to come to one of those trainings to understand what administrators are doing. But the reality is, is if I were, you know, queen or king for a day and able to give schools a tool that could help students immediately, it would be to commit resources to fund positions in every school who are devoted to doing this work, the work that the schools are already doing under the laws you've already passed. You have been at the forefront of this work since 1999, you put on the books a peer harassment statute. We are doing the work. It is often a question of resources and time and getting those who are new to the positions sufficiently trained. And Visbit plays a huge role in providing those trainings up and down the state. And those trainings, um, contrary to some of the testimony I've heard, are not committed to finding ways to keep schools protected, but informing and educating administrators on the rights of students 
understanding the behaviors that implicate those rights and understanding their own affirmative duties to respond. And on that last point, I just wanna emphasize again, schools are not waiting for complaints. They're not allowed to wait under Title IX and Vermont law. Once they have any information, either by witnessing it, hearing it secondhand, having a, a, a suspicion, once they in the school system, as I always say, once the information's in the school bloodstream, we have a duty to act. This is not a complaint driven process. We don't wait for something from the student in writing saying, I want you to do something about this. Under Vermont law, we must act. So schools are doing the hard, tough work, but it does involve an understanding of the rights of all the students involved. And parents increasingly are pushing back when we enforce these rules. They're taking um, their opportunity, as is their right, to challenge these findings in front of school boards. There is a school board right of appeal and go to the boards and say, my child did not engage in harassment. I don't want this on their record. I'm concerned that it will stay on their record and prevent them from getting into college. So we need to be very mindful when we in the school do the work that we are doing it properly and carefully. But even if harassment isn't found, even if bullying is not found, if some behavior is happening, which is detrimental to the environment, the school still will respond. So again, I, I've been going on and I, I appreciate your patience. Well, thank you for the testimony. <clears throat> Questions for Ms. Lynn. So, if we were to move forward with this language, what, what situation, would you summarize by saying there's already so much being done, students in these situations are being captured, Ms. Lynn? And by captured, I mean, you know, the situations are being identified, uh, schools are acting, uh, and that this in some ways isn't, isn't quite, is, isn't, at least on the law books, isn't a problem. No, the school has the tools to respond to the kinds of behaviors what were, that were described to you. You know, the sexual assault in the stairwell, which I think was a New York case. Yes. We, and I say that literally involving me, we, I was responsible for suggesting to AOE that they add the word sexual assault to the definition of sexual harassment in the model policy. And therefore, since 2015, that has been explicitly considered an act of sexual harassment that requires a, a school response. We have the tools, we have the definitions, we have the prohibitions. Largely, much of my work relates to educating administrators about the reach and scope of those definitions. And additionally, helping them develop the systems that will allow for consistent, reliable, repeatable responses procedurally within the school system, like literally, where are the forms? How do those get delivered by a staff member to an administrator for review within the 24 hours that your statute requires? You have a very prompt timeline. Schools are not allowed to sweep these things under the rug. They're required to document what they know and respond within 24 hours. But building that procedural system in a school, there is not a one size fits all. So a lot of my work relates to how do we create those systems? If you pass this law, however, what the law actually does is it says schools can be held legally and financially responsible for the conduct of students whenever the behavior is based on a protected category without consideration to whether or not any, and I'm paraphrasing here, any harm resulted. So when witnesses testify and say, and therefore we think this bill simply encourages schools to engage in alternative dispute resolution with the accused and it doesn't require discipline, that's not the legal reality of what this bill will usher in. If you are saying that after the bill is passed, 
the requirement that the conduct be shown to uh, impact equal access or substantially and adversely affect equal access, that those are no longer considerations. It just merely needs to be unwelcome conduct based on the student's protected category. You have made the school strictly liable for the conduct of minor students, individuals again, over whom the school does not have the same level of control that they do for employees. The changes that are going into law that will affect the employee relationships recognize and reflect that level of control. This goes far further. And so when faced with this understanding, schools are then confronted with, if this behavior continues, regardless of the harm it causes, we're automatically on the hook for this. We are incentivized to discipline, to stop the behavior. And yet, the standard in Section 570F does not match the standard by which schools are allowed to discipline students at all. So you're creating a really low bar for financial liability, but the ability of the schools to, in fact, regulate the student's behavior at issue remains under the 26A standard. So I don't want you to make those two pair up but they are in conflict, given the way the bill is written. It creates this unequal standard. You're responsible for that which you're not empowered to discipline. So I, I see that as a real quandary, and it opens the door to all the kinds of First Amendment liability and litigation that I alluded to earlier. My goal is to have administrators understand the definition, respond and act without having to pick up the phone. If this is passed, on almost every case where there is no discrete effect felt by the victim, they're going to have to always answer the question, do I act? And if I do, am I violating a student's constitutional rights? Because there is no nexus to the educational program or activity that justifies my behavior of regulation. And so it's going to create a lot of questions and concerns, and I think it's counterproductive to the work that, in my view, is already occurring with the tools we already have. The Title IX regulations are gonna be substantial. The ones that are already in existence are very robust, require an expansive, deep, comprehensive response by schools already. And the Biden administration is looking to extend the reach of those regulations to not only address and respond to sexual harassment, but all sex-based harassment. That means harassment on the basis of sex stereotypes, sex characteristics, pregnancy, sexual orientation, gender identity, so the entire Title IX construct, which is detailed and intense, is going to be expanded for all of those categories. Understanding and appreciating the reach and impact of those changes, I think is absolutely vital and prudent before legislating anything that might graft on or complement or augment it. Okay. Helpful. We're well, hearing again from that. we're hearing again from the Human Rights Commission tomorrow, uh, and uh, Senator Gulick uh, has a constituent possibly that might be available, or you're going to reach out so we can hear a little bit from schools. Um, but this is this has been helpful. This is this has certainly been helpful. I I just want to say in closing I. I never like being uh, in a position where it, it, it appears that um, an effort to help students is being um, sidelined or waylaid. Um, it, it, it is not my intention to stand for the proposition that students don't deserve to be protected from these behaviors. It is my position, however, that you know what is proposed doesn't take into account what already exists 
and may in fact be counterproductive to those efforts. So I appreciate your time and your- Ms. Lynn, if, if I could just have a, fi a final thought. So again, this would, this would impact the school if the school just simply ignored it. In other words, kid is called a name, terrible name, and the school just doesn't act, right? Then that's when it becomes a problem. And, and by act, I mean, you know, that you can understand where that kid would feel so terrible about being called that name. They're, they're not taking any steps to separate the kids, saying, hey, you're gonna sit at this lunch table, they're gonna sit at that lunch table. They're really ignoring it, right? It, help me out a little bit here. If the question is, what does the school have to do right now to yeah. change this law? And, and that behavior is witnessed, which largely it would be. Okay. Um, the school has an affirmative duty because of what you've described to consider and treat that as potentially harassing, hazing, and bullying behavior to launch an investigation to send letters home to both the parent of the student who's accused and the parent of the student who is on the receiving end of the behavior to speak with those students and anyone else who was present to write up a written report, which the HRC can then review and audit, which the Department of Education can audit, which the Department of Education United States Office for Civil Rights can audit. They are all interested parties and insist that that paperwork would create, be created and declare whether or not the behavior was or wasn't harassment and again, even if it weren't, is it damaging and destructive? And if so, what are we going to do to prevent a rare occurrence? Okay, so that, just so I, just so I know, Ms. Lynn, before you go on, that is current law. That has to happen. Your school teacher, you witness it automatically. Boom, okay. Yes, AOE's model procedure, page one, top of the page. Okay. Any employee who witnesses the behavior yep. shall immediately report. That is the force of law. And then those automatically, those letters are sent. That's all part of the statute. It all kind of rolls out from there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's helpful. Yeah, it's helpful. Again, take a look at the at the toolkit, which creates a narrative of what those duties are and gives you the resources, the actual letters that would go out. Um, you know, it sort of puts meat on the bones and takes it out of the theoretical. That's a Visbit website. Just put Visbit HHB toolkit and it'll pop up. Thank you very much. Good You're to have you with us. Thank you all for your time and your work. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, committee thoughts, any general thoughts, but we're still, while well, it's fresh. Yeah, let's load it out. No, it's good. Get some more testimony. Yeah, yeah, we'll hear it tomorrow. I'm curious as the, uh, yeah, from Boar's yeah. response. Board's response to this type of well, I think general she wanted to come in again in response to what was said. Not to put anybody on the spot, but Ms. Zaglowski, who represented the, the, the group, Good. and so she's going to come in and respond um, to that. I hear what she has to say. It's an important topic. Yeah, yeah, very important topic. Yeah. Are we keeping you. <laughs> Anything else? Any other thoughts on this at this point? <clears throat> Senator Williams, you're okay. Okay. 